Yes, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Sophia Arend, and I'm the Global Blockchain Business Council's Communications and Content Lead. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the GBBC Virtual Members Forum. This is a bi-weekly webinar series we host uh, showcasing the innovative work of our members around the world. And today we have the pleasure to be joined by Marta Belcher. She is outside general counsel at Protocol Labs and an attorney at Ropes and Gray for a presentation and live audience Q&A on how Protocol Labs is building the next generation of the internet through innovative projects like Filecoin and IPFS, and also the broader legal issues Protocol Labs and other decentralized web projects face. So just briefly before we begin, I'd like to introduce Marta. As I mentioned, she's an attorney at Ropes and Gray and a leader in the area of blockchain law. She also serves as outside general counsel for Protocol Labs, special counsel to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and serves as chair of the Filecoin Foundation, as well as the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web, which we'll learn more about today. She has also been recognized twice by the Financial Times Innovative Lawyer Awards and was named to Law 360's list of rising stars in fintech. She has spoken about blockchain law around the world, including testifying in the New York Senate and speaking in US Congress, European Parliament, and the OECD, and in Davos during the World Economic Forum. She has also drafted amicus briefs in the US Supreme Court and the US Appellate Courts for high profile public interest organizations. We are so pleased to have Marta here with us today, and we welcome your questions at any point during today's webinar. You can submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll take them after her presentation. Thank you, Marta. I will hand things over to you to kick us off. Terrific. Thank you so much for that introduction. I am so excited to be here to talk about Protocol Labs. Uh, I want to start by telling you a story about a small mix up a long time ago that made me start thinking about what it means uh, for the internet to be centralized. So there's an ebook competitor to Kindle called Nook. And back in 2012, people are reading War and Peace on Nook and they notice some irregularities. So throughout the book, the word Kindle had been replaced with the word Nook. So you're reading War and Peace and you see that someone nooked the fire. Um, so clearly what happened here is someone uploading this to Nook did a find and replace to replace the word Kindle with the word Nook, like on the title page, but they inadvertently replaced it throughout the whole book. So in 2012, this is disquieting. Um, it, it's also funny, but it really made me start thinking about what it means to experience so much of our lives through a handful of large corporations and to have no choice but to trust those corporations, uh, to trust that the copy of War and Peace they serve you is the original and to trust those companies not to misuse troves of data about us. Uh, what we do online, who we talk to, what we click on, what we say, uh, to trust them, to keep that data safe from attackers and to protect our civil liberties when responding to requests from governments. This was a small incident a long time ago, but it was the first time I had really thought about what it means for those corporations to be fallible. And this was in 2012. <laughs> so since then, so much has happened. Uh, the Snowden disclosures, Cambridge Analytica, the US presidential elections, and these issues have really come to be at the center of public discourse. Um, at this point, it's, it's trite to say that the internet is controlled by a handful of corporations that control our data. And there are all sorts of proposals for addressing these concerns, many of which involve heavy regulation. But in my view, these proposals presuppose that the internet needs to be centralized, that these internet intermediaries are inevitable. But why is that? Why is it that our internet has to operate like this image on the left? Why is it that if I wanna send a file to someone sitting next to me, it has to be sent across the world and back before it gets to their device? Imagine a group of people who are together in a remote place, uh, maybe a quarantine pod. Uh, if, if they wanted to talk to each other over the internet, that data has to be sent across the world. And if that connection to the outside world is cut off, uh, they can't communicate with each other, even though they're all really close together. And they're using devices with unfathomable computing power. 
So why can't they just be connected directly to each other? Uh, this centralized model also creates single points of failure. And that's particularly concerning when you think about the fact that file storage right now is basically a monopoly. So much of today's internet relies on Amazon Web Services to store and serve billions of websites and applications. We've seen AWS suffer blackouts and some of the most popular and important websites suddenly become unavailable. That's the problem with having a single node in the center, like the drawing on the left. But if you decentralize the internet, multiple nodes can fail without the entire system falling apart. This motivated protocol labs to make the interplanetary file system, IPFS. If you add up all the storage capacity and computing power on individual users' devices, our phones and laptops, you start to wonder whether we really need our data to sit in data warehouses mostly unused when we might instead combine our storage and computing power into effectively a supercomputer network. On today's internet, if I go to a web page, the information is being retrieved from a particular server somewhere in the world, maybe very far away from me. I'm looking for that particular web page in a particular place and hoping it's still in that place. So imagine for a second, if you just read a great book in physical hard copy, and you wanted to recommend that book to a friend. And you say that, well, it's in the New York Public Library. It's on the second floor, third shelf from the left, five books over. That's how today's internet works. To go get that book, you're going to have to fly to New York, go to the public library, and find the place on the shelf where the book's supposed to be. But what if it's not there? What if someone moved it? Uh, what if someone tore pages out? Or what if when you get there, you realize that it's a book that was actually in your backpack the whole time you were traveling there? Again, that's today's internet. It makes a lot more sense just to tell your friend the name of the great book and let your friend find that book by its content, by its name, rather than by its location. And so that's what IPFS does for the internet. Rather than retrieving content by where it is, it retrieves content by what it is. It uses content addressing. Uh, content on the web is addressed directly using cryptographic hashes instead of by reference to a file located on a specific server. This means you don't need an exact web address to find your file. You just need to know its hash. And if you already have it or someone near you has it, you can retrieve it from there. That's actually why it's called the interplanetary file system. Imagine you're on the moon, you can retrieve files from other people on the moon rather than experiencing the delay of sending data back and forth from Earth. IPFS makes decentralization workable, scalable, and profitable by putting power in the hands of end users instead of platforms. And widespread adoption of IPFS could be a major upgrade to the web to protect free speech, resist surveillance, prevent network failure, and empower ordinary inter internet users. Okay, but why would people be motivated to run the infrastructure for a decentralized web? If there's no central corporation for you to pay to host your website or store your data, who's going to host it? Who's gonna shoulder the cost of the massive amount of storage capacity and computing power that it takes to run the web? So the answer for that is Filecoin, which is also developed by Protocol Labs. Filecoin is the incentive layer on top of decentralized storage networks like IPFS. Filecoin allows you to store files in a peer-to-peer -peer network with built-in economic incentives to ensure files are stored reliably over time. Some people call it Airbnb for file storage. People rent out their storage space and earn Filecoin for doing so, and users spend Filecoin to store files. Think of it like a supercomputer-like network of hard drives working together to leverage unused storage capacity. It's a cryptocurrency powered storage network designed to have humanity's most important information, and it's potentially a foundational technology for the decentralized web. Here's how it works. Miners earn Filecoin by providing open hard drive space. Miners compete with each other on factors like reliability, price, and reputation. Users spend Filecoin to store their files encrypted in the decentralized network. Like Airbnb did with physical space, 
Filecoin offers those with extra hard drive space an economic incentive to share it, while offering those looking for extra storage space a faster and cheaper option than traditional cloud storage. It's an alternative to the big centralized uh, data storage like AWS, Google Cloud, and Microsoft Azure. Why Filecoin? Uh, as a result of using Filecoin, we can be less dependent on centralized cloud storage providers. Users, not corporations, own their data and decide where and how to store it, move it, and retire it. And users uh, have their data stored safely and reliably by putting idle storage capacity around the world to work. The Filecoin mainnet launched in October after three years of work. And within a month, we reached one exabyte of storage capacity. So for reference, that's 250 million HD movies, 685,000 years of video calls, or 4,000 copies of Wikipedia. Uh, the Filecoin community itself is decentralized. And it's a large and growing community. It includes miners, developers, token holders, clients, applications, researchers, and users. We got to one exabyte of network storage power because of our 661 active miners, uh, almost 5,000 contributors on GitHub, and organizations building on the network. Filecoin already has an impressive ecosystem of more than 90 organizations that are collaborating on the Filecoin network to build applications, developer tooling, infrastructure, and more. Here's an example of an app in the ecosystem that's built on top of Filecoin called Slate. Slate is like Dropbox for Filecoin. It's an open source storage system for your data that makes it easy to collect, organize, and share them anywhere on the web. Um, PL is probably best known for IPFS and Filecoin, um, but that actually isn't all we do. Since being founded in 2014, PL has launched dozens of products designed to democratize the web. So that includes libp2p, which is a modular networking stack that lets developers build p2p networks, um, IPLD, which includes standards for creating addressable, linkable, decentralized data structures, and DRAND, which is a, a distributed randomness beacon developed by researchers at PL, which creates publicly verifiable, unpredictable random values, which helps make cryptographic systems run smoothly. Uh, we also have multi-formats, which is a group of protocols to make systems interoperable and upgradable. Uh, Protocol Labs believes that the internet has become humanity's most important technology, and we build protocols, systems, and tools to improve how the internet works. Um, we hope that we're creating tomorrow's internet uh, built on a new and decentralized internet infrastructure, um, and we hope that you will join us in our mission to upgrade the web. Uh, so I will, pa I will pause there and uh, uh, open it up to questions from the audience and Sophia. Hi, Marta. Thanks so much. I really like the, the terms that you explained that in. I mean, it, it definitely makes a lot more sense to me. Um, in, with your background as a lawyer, I think a good place to start with questions is what are some of the legal issues facing the decentralized web and maybe even cryptocurrencies? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, I think a couple of years ago, uh, we started to see a bunch of different SEC actions and, you know, leaving aside cryptocurrency generally, um, just, just thinking about the decentralized web, um, there was actually an uh, SEC enforcement action back in 2018 against a decentralized exchange called EtherDelta. And the SEC basically said that um, EtherDelta's founder um, wrote and deployed this EtherDelta smart contract, which he should have known would contribute to violations of the Exchange Act, and basically went after EtherDelta's founder for providing an algorithm that could be providing a trading facility. Um, and so at the time, we started thinking about what that language means for people who are building um, open source projects um, in the decentralized web, you know, that ultimately could be used, um, for example, in the cryptocurrency space um, as like, let's go into decentralized exchanges as one example. 
Um, the idea that the SEC, this enforcement agency, could be going after folks for deploying code um, was uh, pretty, <laughs> a pretty, um, pretty harsh. And so at the time, um, some folks at EFF, uh, myself, Rainey Reitman, um, Aaron Mackey, wrote a letter to the SEC and basically said, like, hey, we think that code is speech and, and that covered by the First Amendment. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of court cases that, that say that. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure that you don't think that you can go after folks for just writing code that they should, should have known will be deployed in some way that you don't like. Um, and so I think that was the first, the first time we saw um, a glimpse into what the problems for the decentralized web might be in the future. Uh, and then what happened recently that is the most concerning to me actually about all this um, is the, the Department of Justice in the US just uh, released an enforcement framework um, that is uh, pretty, pretty harsh with regards to uh, the ability to transact online um, financially um, anonymously. Um, and <laughs> it was, uh, uh, pretty shocking, actually. They they said that they think that um, privacy coins, um, which are you know allow for financial um, anonymity, uh, they they basically said that using a privacy coin um, is potential evidence of of committing crimes. Um, they said that um, cryptocurrency mixers, um, uh, which allow folks to again transact anonymously, um, are potentially also uh, uh, in fact, just operating a mixer or using a mixer could be a crime. Um, so basically, we're getting to a place where the DOJ, say, you know, imagine like a law that says that you can't hand someone a $20 bill without creating a record of that transaction. Like fundamentally, the DOJ's position here is that anonymous transactions online aren't allowed. Um, and I think that it's, it's uh, really potentially problematic, not just for cryptocurrencies, um, but for, for the decentral, decentralized web um, generally. So I'll pause there, but I, I think that's the things that I'm thinking about the most in the, in the legal world right now in the decentralized web and cryptocurrencies in particular. Yeah, I think, I think you've, you've really got folks thinking here. We have a flurry of questions coming in um, and I'll just start with this one. So it says, it asks, how liable are you for the content stored on your hard drive? So if someone decides to upload illegal content into the decentralized web, are you liable for what they've uploaded? Yeah, so, so look, li liability is, is obviously different by jurisdiction, right? Um, and, and there are jurisdictions where, you know, you upload a picture of, of Winnie the Pooh and that's potentially, um, that's potentially illegal. So, you know, unfortunately the decentralized web is a place, um, <laughs> there, there's earth law and uh, there's the decentralized web and, um, you know, earth law is, is highly uh, geographically variable. And so it, it really depends um, on your geography. Um, what I will say is that we hope that by running, um, by sort of participating in this uh, decentralized storage network, um, you can take the decisions about what content is and is not allowed and actually put it in the hands of users and put it in the hands of node operators. In other words, take the decision-making capacity about what content is and is not allowed and make it decentralized. Um, not have some centralized institution that's saying this content's not allowed, this content is allowed. Right, would that also help you meet um, the legal requirements by jurisdiction? Um, well, I, I think so. That's that's the idea, right? Um, right by right. jurisdiction and also, so like imagine, for example, a set of tools um, that allow you to say, um, you know, I'm a uh, I'm a, um, a particular particular node operator, or I'm 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 a you know particular storage uh, miner, and I do want to be allowed. I do want to allow this type of content. I don't want to allow this kind of content, um, potentially with, you know, a checkbox that says I'm in this jurisdiction and I don't want, mm -hmm. um, I don't want this type of content to be stored here. Um, you could potentially build tools if you wanted to, um, on top of a decentralized network that would allow for decision-making capabilities to be made in a decentralized manner, rather than having some centralized institution decide, decide that. 
Thank you. Um, is there also a risk that your data can disappear? I think yeah. there's some concern. Yeah. So, so that's that's a great question. So that is definitely true of the centralized web, um, uh, generally, right? Um, the idea with the, uh, the, the the way that we've handled it um, in our network um, is that miners uh, basically put up uh, collateral, and um, we have a sort of system that automatically checks that you are to to, to vastly oversimplify, automatically checks that um, these files are being stored. Um, and you're not going to be compensated in Filecoin. And in fact, you'll probably be punished if you aren't continuing to store the data that you are um, in fact saying that you are storing. Um, and we also have the ability to um, you know, make that verifiable. Whereas when you go to Dropbox or something, for example, I, I shouldn't call it Dropbox, but if when you go to any, you know, any particular centralized institution, um, you don't necessarily know. They, they have, you, know, you don't know necessarily what, what they're doing with your data. Right. So you've alluded to some of the civil liberties issues that DWeb and other, you know, cryptocurrencies can address. Can you expand on what some of those are? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I a lot of my work, um, particularly with EFF, has been around financial privacy, um, and I think that's really important um, for cryptocurrencies generally. Um, this is sort of aside from my work with um, Protocol Labs. Um, I think. Uh, there's a ton of um, financial censorship uh, in the world. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, you see a lot of examples of payment processors cutting off services to like perfectly legal entities that they find unsavory, like adult, adult bookstores or adult social networks. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the things that's really great about cryptocurrency is in the ability to transact uh, without centralized institutions um, is the ability to transact like you would with cash um, and, and you know, be able to uh, pay people without a centralized institution deciding um, who, who you should be paying. Um, and in terms of financial privacy, um, you know, particularly in the US, there isn't a lot of it when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, uh, your financial transactions, uh, thanks to the Bank Secrecy Act. And uh, when I think about financial privacy, I often think about this really stunning picture that came out of the uh, that came out of the Hong Kong protests. So there's this picture, and it's all these people in line at the subway station, and they're waiting to use cash uh, at the subway station to buy their tickets because they don't want to be placed at the scene of the protest if they use their metro cards. Um, and so for me, that really underscores that you know, a cashless society is a surveillance society and decentralized technologies really allow us to transact online in a way that protects our civil liberties the same way that cash does. Um, so that, that is, that is a, a taste of the civil liberties issues that um, I'm thinking about in this space. Sure, and I definitely remember that photo and being struck by it. And somebody asked, so can IPFS prevent government censorship of information and in that vein, has adoption been more widespread in countries where this is a concern? Um, so, you know, in general, um, decentralized systems, depending on how you build them, um, can be, uh, in theory, <laughs> used to uh, 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 circumvent cer certain type of censorship. Um, I think that, uh, there's a, a question as to how you want to um, implement that and, and how you can implement that um, and whether that necessarily needs to be true in all decentralized systems, like alluding to what I was talking about earlier, like whether you could actually instead um, decentralize the ability uh, to, to do content moderation. Um, and I, so I, but I do think that these types of technologies um, certainly are in many ways censorship resistant. Um, and uh, not speaking necessarily about IPFS in particular. Yeah, um, shifting more towards some practical questions I think people have, they're asking, so what is the cost of storage on Filecoin and how does it compare to traditional cloud storage? Um, shocking, uh, the answer is, um, my understanding is shockingly low. Um, <laughs> like I, I remember seeing, there have been some Twitter threads that I've seen that compare the prices, and um, it's just it's just very very low. Um, you know, right now we 
we within a month reaching an exabyte of data was we, we were just completely blown away um, <laughs> that we reached that storage capacity. Um, so just from a you know all the way that it works is this is all market economics. It's all supply demand, um, and so you know we have an incredible an incredible supply and a, a growing demand, um, and you know so far it's it's been uh, an extremely it's an extremely from what I understand a completely ex extremely cost efficient way of uh, of uh, handling. Uh, uh, your data. Yeah. Um, is there also a transaction service element that allows users to convert file coins to USD? Oh yeah. So you can um, you can actually convert your file coin to USD. So there are a ton of just like any other cryptocurrency. Um, there are a bunch of exchanges that actually have listed file coin where you can go and exchange your file coin for US dollars. You could exchange it for Ethereum or you can exchange it for Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. So there are lots of exchanges that have list, li listed Filecoin um, already, even though we're, we're just a, a month in. But I mean, I think more importantly, you can actually use your Filecoin to pay for the services on the network. You know, we're, we're really, a, the whole point of Filecoin is for this to be a useful, um, this, for this to be a, a, a useful thing where you can actually use your Filecoin um, in exchange for, um, for, for, for data storage on the network. And you can pay US dollars to get Filecoin so that you can um, store files on our network. Yeah, could you also just walk us through um, how you would go about participating in the Filecoin network, either to store or to solicit storage services? Yeah, um, there, there, there are so many ways. So, you know, Filecoin, uh, is is a pretty pretty low layer, right? And so um, there are definitely a lot of applications being built on top of Filecoin that are the user friendly way of kind of interacting with the Filecoin network. So I showed you Slate as as one example. Um, so I mean, for folks who want to participate in the Filecoin network, there's so many ways you can be involved. Um, we have a ton of hackathons right now. There are, there are hundred literally hundreds of projects that are being. Um, built on top of Filecoin, um, lots of applications, and then you know users themselves interact with can interact with the applications that interact with the Filecoin network or can interact with the Filecoin network um, directly. Um, and of course, there's miners. <laughs> you can also you know uh, effectively become a miner and earn Filecoin by renting out um, your excess storage capacity. You just mentioned uh, applications built on Filecoin. We had someone ask, what are the future? What future file? Coin, forgive me, what future Filecoin applications are in the works? Is Protocol Labs working on anything? Oh, gosh. Um, so, so yes. I mean, Pro Protocol Labs is, is working on a, a ton of different projects, but um, there's, I think, more importantly, we actually uh, interact with a pretty broad ecosystem of folks who are, um, who are building um, on top of uh, the Filecoin network. Um, and so I had shown that slide where we have um, just a, a crazy number of, of applications. I'll show it again, just so you can see it's, it's really, it's really um, quite impressive. Um, here's the, here's the current Filecoin ecosystem. Um, so like one example is the Shoa Foundation um, at USC um, has a bunch of um, really interesting uh, and important um, data that is videos um, of um, Holocaust survivors and their testimonials. Um, and so that um, is all being stored uh, on, on the Filecoin network um, by, uh, by uh, the Sterling project. Um, you also have things like, um, you also have things like the internet archive, right? That had already existed that is storing a bunch of its open data sets. Um, on the Filecoin network. So, so you get a lot of really interesting and important uh, uh, pieces of data. And you, the idea really is, is for us to be able to take humanity's most important data and, and store it on the Filecoin network. And um, we've been really lucky to have an in incredible uh, group, of, group of companies and projects that have already been uh, storing their data with us on, on Filecoin. That's excellent. And Marta, if, if it's all right with you, maybe we can share those slides with the folks who've dialed in today as a PDF or something. So we'll definitely send around resources to everyone. We've had a lot of questions come in and um, somebody's just asked, so how does Protocol Labs go about educating the typical internet user on the benefits of the decentralized web? 
Well, so some of some of that is protocol labs, um, and and you know we we do have something called Proto School um, that has uh, is is a project that's sort of affiliated with protocol labs that has a lot of really awesome educational materials. Um, there's also separately, um, so I also um, serve as the board chair of the Filecoin Foundation uh, and the Filecoin Foundation for the decentralized web. Um, so these are two. Uh, these are are, are two organizations um, that are you know dedicated to um, uh, promoting uh, Filecoin's ability to uh, store humanity's most important data and and promote these these types of tools. And and one of the things that the Filecoin Foundation does um, is uh, actually education around the decentralized web. That's one of our one of our core goals. Um, and uh, that's that's true on for both the Filecoin Foundation and also for the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web, which focuses not just on Filecoin and education about Filecoin, but about the, de uh, the decentralized web uh, more broadly. Yeah, and to those folks who's, who've been asking about education and resources, we'll be sure to send around those links as well as a follow up and we'll get we'll get all the good information from Marta. Um, so Marta, anything else you'd like to any parting words or final words you'd like to leave us with today? Gosh, um, you know, I spend a lot of my time as a lawyer uh, thinking about uh, how regulators are, are going to be, I think, uh, thinking about the decentralized web. Um, and uh, I, I think my parting words are, you know, that I, I, I really hope that um, the, the usefulness of these types of tools and, and the tools that we're building uh, is something that, that regulators and policymakers are, are going to see and uh, be friendly to as they're, as they're um, thinking about uh, regulations. Absolutely. I, I think, I think uh, myself and the other listeners on here would, would echo those thoughts. So thank you so much for joining us today. We will share a recording of this webinar with those who weren't able to join us live. Um, and as well, we will also send around resources so you can learn more about the decentralized web, protocol labs, and uh, Filecoin, Filecoin Foundation. Um, Marta, has, and, um, Marta has been kind enough to probably let us share her slides with you as well. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, you so Marta. much, Sophia. Bye, everyone.